Hello, Brooks. The title of my talk today is Get Out the Vote or Indecision 2024. These are both millennial references that other teachers in the room might get, so I apologize for the in-group information. But I grew up with this. I grew up with the call for young people to get involved, and especially to vote, since historically, young people do not do so in large numbers. At the same time, when I was young, we heard an indictment of US politics, mocking the folly of those who supposedly, uh, supposedly lead us or the system itself. It's a bit of a conundrum. Things in the realm of politics and government probably do not feel perfect to you right now, and that's okay. But I do hope that you walk away from chapel today with a, new, with a renewed sense of your political worth and purpose. If I succeed at doing one thing today, I hope to successfully communicate to you all the power, privilege, and importance of your political voices, each and every one of you. The election in the United States is less than six weeks away. As I announced last week, there is a concerted effort by adults at Brooks to make sure that every eligible student voter is registered and has a plan to vote. Mr. Huntington and I will be around at lunch today to chat more, so if you'd like to talk to us about that, please come do so. But again, why vote, Mr. Slaby, you might be thinking. What can my lone vote do? Does it even really matter? Ultimately, that's a question each of you have to answer when the time comes. Not voting, when done after thoughtful reflection, is perhaps a legitimate choice, but it's not a choice for everyone, and certainly for most of human history, it was a choice available only to very few people. You guessed it, a history teacher is giving a chapel talk, so there's gonna be a mini history lesson. So buckle up. As those, uh, as those of you who went through third and fourth form history know, modern democratic republics are not exactly the historical norm. For most of human history, political power flowed through people's veins came at the end of a sword, or was handed down by God. Most people didn't have a vote. Voting didn't really exist. Almost no one had a say in what their government did, let alone what it even looked like. There are pre-modern counterexamples, instances of shared governance, even degrees of democracy. But it's really not until the modern era that we get groups of people, citizens, who are part of a state a nation, where they have a direct or at least semi-direct role in deciding who is in charge and by extension, how things work. I want to be clear, this system is not unique to the United States. Representative democracy is something that we as a country have championed, both sincerely and ironically, over the decades and centuries, but we are most certainly not the only place in the world today where everyday people play a role in and get a say about their government. But again, if we think about the larger and longer story of human history, this really is a special thing. In the United States, we fought for, and by continuing to participate in democratic government, continue to make real the claim that we are a nation of the people, by the people, and for the people. Of course, when the United States was founded in 1776, that people was a pretty limited group. In terms of voting rights, which varied somewhat state to state, what that really meant in practice was land-owning men, and in many places, land-owning white men. But free black men did initially have the vote in some places in the United States. This actually changed over time, giving us an example of one of the unfortunate lessons of history that things don't always necessarily just get better over time. In 1807, in New Jersey, my home state, just a year before the United States would ban the transatlantic slave trade itself, voting rights were taken away from black men. In the decades leading up to the US Civil War, the rights of African Americans, such as they were, were decreased, including voting rights for free black men. In the period after the Civil War, known as Reconstruction, Americans elected the first black members of Congress. Part of what made that possible were key amendments to the US Constitution, the key document of our government. 
The 13th Amendment outlawed slavery, mostly. The 14th Amendment shored up the citizenship of African Americans. And the 15th Amendment outlawed discrimination against voting based on race and previous enslavement. But then there was backlash, and Jim Crow laws and practices once again made it harder for black men to vote. All the while, women of all races were mostly denied the franchise, as it's sometimes called. Not, it should be noted, universally. In 1869, Wyoming granted women the right to vote. But it wasn't until another amendment to the US Constitution, the 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920, that gender discrimination in voting was abolished. It would take as late as 1959 for indigenous women in Alaska to be able to vote. And even though on paper just about all adult citizens can technically vote, de facto racism has presented the full and equal exercise of that right. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 aim, has aimed to change that, and it did for a while. But more recently, in 2013, the Supreme Court called into question provisions of that law. The Chief Justice, in his logic in part, cited decades of decreased racial discrimination as a, reading, as a reason for not needing such a fulsome law. Unfortunately, voter suppression, gerrymandering, and other practices that lead to unequal voting opportunities, including ones based on race, are still all too common. Which is all to say, again, that we do have this special thing, some of us. And even, if it's, even in its imperfections, we all ought to take the opportunities that we have. In Massachusetts, for example, if you are a US citizen, a resident of the state, if you'll be 18 years old by election day, and you have not been convicted of a felony, you have the right to vote in this election. So I'm here to tell you all that you matter, each and every one of you. What you think matters. Your views matter. Your experience and your existence matter. It's become fashionable in recent years to push back against the supposed specialness of young people. To that I say nonsense. You are special each and every one of you. In my history classes, I sometimes have occasion to gently remind my students that our primary goal is to understand the past, not to judge it. But I always try to follow up right away by emphasizing our humanity, that we naturally want to judge things. We each have our own sense of right and wrong. We have opinions and ideas and values. In this election season and beyond, I encourage you to engage civilly with those. Get to know yourself better. Pay attention to the news a bit more. What are the actual policies at hand? How might the decisions of politicians affect your future and the future of the world? Even when you're frustrated, or perhaps especially when you're frustrated with what's going on, I urge you to care to think, to feel, to thoughtfully and meaningfully participate in the discourse. As this is chapel, and Mr. Chapman is right behind me, I suggest you do all of this with not just intellectual rigor and passion, so do it with those please, but do this also with kindness, with care, with, with thoughtfulness, with compassion, with grace, and yes, with love in your heart. As the great American writer James Baldwin once said, we can disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and denial of my humanity and right to exist. I am here to tell you, to remind you all that we care for you, that we love you, that each and every one of you matter. And if you're going to be 18 years old by election day and you meet the other requirements, we are here to support you in exercising your right to vote. Get registered, have a plan for voting, be involved and engaged. Thank you. <laughs>